song Joy for Me. Thank you very much to the worship band. Uh, some joyful songs this morning. It's, uh, it's the time to be, to be joyful regardless of uh, our circumstances or situations because a child is born unto us. And it's my privilege today to bring to you the Word of God. And on Sunday we quickly looked at the, the account of Jesus uh, being conceived by the Holy Spirit, but through the eyes of Joseph. So this morning uh, it will be a child is born unto us, part two, where we will see the birth of Christ through the eyes of Mary, to see exactly what happened before Jesus was born and on the day which he was born. So Sunday's uh, background, when we looked at Matthew 1, verses 18 to 24, we saw that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, which was an act of God alone. The birth of Jesus was a miraculous thing that wasn't possible by human means. God did use Mary to give birth to Jesus, but it was God that orchestrated this whole event. We've seen that Joseph thought that Mary was with another man as she was pregnant when they got engaged. And he thought to himself that he will divorce of Mary quietly without putting her to shame or without publicly disgracing her. So while he was thinking about all these things, the angel Gabriel appeared to Joseph while in a dream and told him that this boy, this child, will be called Jesus. He is from the Most High. And we saw how obedient Joseph was. He did exactly what the angel commanded him. And he woke up and he did exactly what Gabriel told him. So our first passage today would be from Luke 1, verse 26, up until uh, verse 33. And it's the encounter that Mary had with Gabriel. So this is just the, uh, the passage before our passage for today. And I'll read. If you have your Bibles with you, you can follow along. So in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the highest 
and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Just imagine a, a 14 to a 17 year old Mary, an angel of the Lord telling her that you will conceive uh, the, ch the son of God. She was still a teenager. Just imagine how afraid she was in this account. And we see in these following verses, there's a few things that stand out regarding these statements that Gabriel is making about Jesus. And the first one will be in verse 31. We see that Jesus' name means the Lord saves. So in verse 31, we see that Jesus will save, which means he will save the nation of Israel, but he'll also save everyone that believes in him, in even the Gentile nations. And in verse 32a, it says that he will be the son of the Most High. And interesting, when we look at God's name in the Hebrew writings, one of his names, it says the following, uh, Al Alyon. That's one of God's names in Hebrew. So it basically, it is one of God's names. So it would, it's saying that Jesus would be the son of the Most High. So what this means is, since since a son bears his qualities of his father, so he will have exactly the same qualities as his father. So the angel is saying he will be a son of the Most High. So it means that Jesus will, in a sense, be like his father. He will have the same attributes, the, the same character, the same nature, and he will be God himself. So this is what Gabriel is actually telling uh, Mary, and interesting, uh, so Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit. So Joseph was his earthly father, but Joseph wasn't his real father. But what's interesting with that is, we all know when Adam sinned, all of us were born with the original sin in us. But Jesus, not coming from Adam, shows us that he was not born with sin. He was born from God. That is why Jesus was able to save us, because he wasn't born with that original DNA uh, that makes us sin. Uh, I mean, if we look at children, we don't teach them to, to sin or to do bad. We just do it after time. It's that original DNA that we have in us that came through the line of Adam. But Jesus didn't come from the line of Adam. He came from God himself through Mary. So Jesus wasn't born with that original sin inside of him. So Jesus would be exactly like God. He would be the Son of the Most High. He will be equal to God in all His qualities. And the second part of this verse, it says that Jesus would come from the line of David. And we find this in 2 Samuel 7 verses 12 to 13. When your days are fulfilled, and you lay down with your fathers, I will raise you up, your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So we see Jesus came through the line of Adam, oh, the line, through the line of David, because Mary came through, she's, she's in the same line as King David. And then in verse 33, verse, uh, yeah, verse 33 the kingdom of Jesus will last forever. Uh, we find evidence of this in Daniel 7, verse 27. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. 
His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So even before Jesus was born, this was predicted. This was given by the angel Gabriel to Mary and said, this is what Jesus would come to do. So it's miraculous to see uh, the, all of these evidence of what Jesus came to do for us. So this was Mary's encounter with the angel Gabriel. It's almost similar to the encounter that, that Joseph had. There's only a few things that's a little bit different. And our, our scripture reading for today is Luke 2, verses 1 to 8. And this is the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The first register, this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And just imagine, I think from a woman's perspective, all the moms here today uh, giving birth in a place where there's actually no place for you to give birth. I can just imagine uh, what went through Mary and Joseph's mind uh, while we are reading this passage. And like I said on Sunday, the Bible's account of Jesus' birth is really brief. Only Luke includes it, like we just read. It's only the Gospel of Luke that tells us the birth of Jesus. The Old Testament predicted that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And we have evidence of this in Matthew 2, verses 5 to 6. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So here we see that this prediction came true when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And it's actually, there's a few things that is actually happening here. Happening here because they are actually from, from Nazareth, but they ended up in Bethlehem. So we've seen that it is by divine intervention by God that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem as predicted in Scripture because Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth. So Nazareth was approximately 157 kilometers away from Bethlehem. That's a far way to walk. It's a very far way to walk. Uh, in normal circumstances, if Mary's time for labor came near, they would never have been able to be in Bethlehem if it wasn't for a sequence of events that sent them to Bethlehem. So we see that it's almost 160 kilometers. That's how far Bethlehem is from Nazareth. So. Let's say, for instance, if Mary was due tomorrow, would she make it today on a horse or walking 160 kilometers to give birth? I don't think so. So there's a few things that was actually happening here that send them to Bethlehem. So first of them is we do not, we do not know much about this census uh, other than what Luke is telling us. And it is claimed, it is said that Joseph owned land in Bethlehem. So he had a piece of land or a property in Bethlehem. So that is why Joseph needed to go and register for this census. And interesting enough, 
the women didn't need to go to be registered as the men took this responsibility upon themselves to go and register the whole family. So they would go and register everyone. But when we've, we've just read here in Luke 2 that Mary went with Joseph. So if women weren't really uh, allowed to go with the men, why was Mary going with Joseph to Bethlehem? So one of them is the first thing, and we briefly mentioned this on Sunday. It has been said that all the gossiping tongues in the community, we said on Sunday that um, when Joseph found out that she was with a child, he kept it quiet because he wanted to divorce of her because if you committed adultery, you would receive the death penalty. So obviously the community was saying, hey, look, Joseph and Mary, they are engaged, but she's already, already pregnant. So they were speaking already in the community that, but why is Mary pregnant? So it's been said that the gossiping tongues actually led Mary to go with Joseph. So for her to get away from the community, talking and spreading stories about her, she went with Joseph. That is how she ended up in Bethlehem. And it's interesting that God uses strange circumstances for his good. Here we see that yet again. Circumstances that maybe didn't look great to them, he used it as good. I mean, people were gossiping about Mary, and now this governor is telling them, no, but you could need to go and register. So Mary went with Joseph. So God is using these events so that his will be done in the lives of Mary and Joseph. So we see here that God uses strange circumstances for his good as a decree of the emperor in Rome and the gossiping tongues to bring Mary to Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy of Christ being born in Bethlehem. Yet again, we have evidence in Scripture that regardless of where we find ourselves or what we are in, God uses all circumstances for His good and for His will and plan to come Pause, even if it looks bad to us. I mean, this was probably a very terrible situation for Mary as she was so young and people were gossiping about her being pregnant. But God used the gossiping tongues to send her with Joseph to Bethlehem. So here we see that God uses strange circumstances to let his will come past. So when Joseph and Mary arrived in Bethlehem, there were approximately, they say, 500 residents living in Bethlehem, and they could not find a place to stay. So she gave birth to Jesus and laid him in a manger, a feeding rack for animals. So this indicates either that she gave birth in a stable or in a very poor home where animals share the same roof as the family. So the first century homes were usually constructed like that. The animals were living on the bottom floor and uh, the residents would be living on the top floor. So everyone would be living together in the same place. So this is where Mary gave birth. So whatever the details, the incident points to the obscurity, poverty, and even rejection of Jesus' birth. So we see when Jesus is born, the world already rejected him. From birth, the world has rejected our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born in these circumstances. We see even, we see that in verse 6, that Mary herself wrapped the baby in clothes. So this indicates that there was not even a midwife present to help Mary give birth. So she gave birth to Jesus alone. This indicates, it shows us that she was alone. She and Joseph was 
alone. So from Jesus' birth, we see that the world rejected our Lord and our Savior. John MacArthur said the following about the birth of Christ. When Jesus came into the world, He was born in the most comfortless conditions. A smelly, filthy, cold shelter surrounded by loud animals. It was a fitting entrance for the Son of Man who had nowhere to lay His head. Luke 9 verse 58. The one who was in the world and the world was made through Him and the world did not even know Him. Imagine that. The one that created the world doesn't even have a place for you to, to be born. It's for the one who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Imagine God himself came as a human being like us, born in a stable, the God of the universe, the creator that spoke everything into existence, chose to be born in the likeness of man. There's, there's not a bigger indication than love uh, that I find anywhere in the Bible than this, that God, the one that created us, came to look like us and live among us. For the Son of Man, who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many, by bearing our sins in His body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live righteously. His humble birth was appropriate. Jesus came to die as a substitute in the place of wretched sinners. So this is reason why we can be glad today. This is why we celebrate Christmas. Because if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ, if it wasn't for God Himself coming, being born in a stable, we would have all been lost. There would be no hope for us as we all know we can't save ourselves. Have you, have you ever tried to, to, to do something or to, to change something about yourself or a situation? You, we usually start off well, but along the line, we tend to like fall off the track. And it usually happens uh, before a new year. You know, the 1st of January, everyone has all of these uh, New Year's resolutions. And they usually start off fresh up until like the 10th of January. And then, because we try to do it out of our own. So Jesus came to save us because we will never be able to save ourselves. This is why He was born. The greatest gift ever to be given to us is the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are three reasons why the birth of Jesus is important to us. And I think I've just mentioned it now. John 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. So God loved the world, the created world that He created, even though it was stained by sin from the, the, the account in Genesis 3. God still loved the world and He gave His Son for all of us who would believe in His name so that we will not perish but have eternal life. The second one is Luke 2 uh, verse 30 and this was the prophet Simeon that saw Jesus in the temple and he said the following, For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. Jesus would be the Savior and Redeemer of all people, including us today. Romans 5 uh, verse 8, But God showed His love for us that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. So if Christ was never born for us, Christ could have never died for our sins. So these are just a few reasons why Jesus was born for us. And then Romans 3, verse 21 to 26, and I'll read it. One of the other reasons, and it's parallel with Romans 5, verse 8. And we have more than enough um, good news today to be happy. I mean, the light came down. A child is born unto us for each one of us that confesses of our sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll read Romans 3, verse 21 to 26. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus who God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness, righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So without the birth of Christ, there would never be any crucifixion. This is why Jesus is born unto us. We've seen Jesus is the Savior. He's the Redeemer. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the King of Kings. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the bright morning star. And Jesus Christ was born unto us, to save us, to redeem us, to put us into right standing with God. And this is why we are happy today. This is why we are glad today. The world can show us a lot of things about Christmas, but we know the true meaning about Christmas today, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. For a child is born unto us. Father, we, we thank you from our innermost being that you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be born into a fallen race so that by his perfect life and his sacrificial death, he might be lifted on the wooden cross in the same way that Moses was lifted the bronze serpent in the wilderness so that all who looked would live. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful plan of your salvation that you in your grace purposed would be the only way that mankind could be saved from his sin. And so you sent your only begotten Son to be born of a virgin into the human race, God becoming man, so that man might be eternally clothed in the righteous garments of God. Thank you that by his human life and physical death, he was able to reconcile us back to God, forgave us of our sins, and break the power of death in the lives of all who believe in his name. Thank you that from his unpretentious beginning where he had nowhere to lay his head to his lifelong submission of the Father he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross thank you Father for the birth of my Redeemer and I rejoice in the God of my Savior I know a lot of people call you Jesus but I call you Savior I call you Redeemer, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.